Rock Church. How you doing? Good. My name's Caleb. Man, it's cool to see a lot of baptisms, right? Yeah. Glory to God. So good. Uh, before we start, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to those of you that have been praying for our family at this time. Um, we're thankful for you. Thankful for uh, the local church. I don't know how people go through hard times without the support of the local church. And uh, I'd encourage you and challenge you, if you're going through something difficult, don't run from the church. Run to the church. Run to God's people. Because it's a blessing. So I just want to say thank you for praying for me and my family. Um, So, sorry to start out on a bummer tone. But today we are in Romans 9. We're continuing on in our Romans study that we've been going on for 29 weeks. Uh, We are going to be in Romans 9, 24 through 29, and I've entitled this message, In His Sovereign Mercy. We're talking about God being sovereign over all things, control of everything, and He is merciful. I don't want to rehash all that has been said the last two weeks in Romans 9, but my message comes on the tails of Brian and Bill's, so I need to recap a little bit. Uh, If you... I would encourage you to listen to those messages because they were amazing, so good. Uh, But as a way of reminder, I just want to say all of chapter 9 is speaking of God's merciful, sovereign plan of salvation for his people. Chapter 9 starts with the Apostle Paul saying he was grieved that his people, the Jews, have missed the gospel. They don't worship the Messiah, his people They had not had their sins forgiven by Jesus, and therefore they stood condemned before a holy God. Paul stated that Israel was the people that God revealed himself to and revealed the law to and entered into a covenant with in the Old Testament. But Bill taught us two weeks ago that Paul explained it's not just being born as a Jew. It's not just your ethnicity or your race or your heritage that makes you part of God's chosen people. The truth is something that Paul has come back to throughout the letter of Romans numerous times. It, he has repeatedly said that it is not any of those things, your, your ethnicity, your race, where you were born, how you were born, that brings you to salvation. No, it is being God's chosen people who live by faith. And so in the last several verses that we've studied in chapter 9, Paul has been defending this statement that he made in verse 6. Romans 9, 6, it says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. This was the question he assumed that the readers of Romans were thinking at this time as they went through this, these verses here. He assumed they were thinking this question, if many in Israel stand condemned and are not saved, has God's word, has his promise, has his covenant failed, has God failed? And Paul answered here in verse 6, of course not, because God is sovereign and because he is merciful. Paul has been laying out his case of why it is not heritage that will save the Israelite or anyone else by pointing to the Old Testament as his evidence. He mentioned a Jacob, right? He mentioned Jacob and Esau, and then he went to Pharaoh like Brian talked about last week. Ultimately, these examples are to repeat what God said to Moses in Exodus 15, He says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Brian reminded us last week that God is God, and he has never once and never will be unfair in his treatment toward anyone. Each and every act of mercy of our holy God that has been shown to any sinful person or sinful people is mind-boggling and amazing, if we think about that. So today we will continue to unpack Paul's defense for this statement. He will point to two Old Testament prophets in our verses today. And again, Paul wants to remind his readers to further understand that God's word has not failed because of his sovereign mercy. So before we pray, allow me to remind you of those two characteristics that I keep repeating. Sovereignty. What does it mean for God to be sovereign? We need to understand this. We need to wrestle with this. 
To be sovereign means that God is immortal. He is above all, before all. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the creator over all things. He holds all things together, both seen and unseen. He knows all things completely, past, present, future, Nothing is impossible for him, and he has supreme authority, rule, and control over all things to direct, judge, or give mercy. Speaking of the sovereign mercy of God, the preacher Jonathan Edwards said this, God is pleased to show mercy to his enemies according to his own sovereign pleasure. Though he is infinitely above all and stands in no need of creatures, yet he is graciously pleased to take a merciful notice of poor worms in the dust. That is our God. And to define mercy for us, it means that mercy means to love or have compassion, to show goodness, kindness, forgiveness, to show divine forbearance and showing compassion and passing over of sins, to have pity on, and mercy is God's patience in action. This, uh, speaking of this mercy, the theological professor, professor Millard Erickson said, God's mercy is his tender-hearted, loving compassion for his people. It is his tenderness of heart toward the needy. If grace contemplates humans as sinful, guilty, and condemned, mercy sees them as miserable and needy. So my prayer this weekend is that we will see God's good purpose for his people brought about in his sovereign mercy. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you are near to us, that you are sovereign, that you are merciful, that we can trust that, we can trust you. Lord, I pray you'd speak to us now. Pray your word would go out. You'd speak to your people. You would comfort. You would challenge. You would exhort. You would change us, Jesus. We need you so much. So we commit this time to you. We pray that in your name. Amen. So let's look together to Romans 9, verse 24. We're picking up mid-sentence, mid-verse, mid-thought of where we left off last week with Pastor Brian. Paul started a question in verse 22, and allow me to summarize it quickly before we get to this verse 24. The summary is basically this. This is his question. What if? What if God has wanted to show his sovereign mercy all along, even though he has the right to show anger and power to sinners, but has always been very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who have rejected him and are now destined for destruction. In fact, God is patient so that the riches of his glory would shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And then that takes us to verse 24, even us, if you know Jesus, even you, even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So we need to see this, God's patient endurance shown toward those who have rejected him and continue to reject him and rebel against him. That endurance, that patience that God shows them, it makes his mercy on his people, on the Christian, look even more glorious. And that includes Jews and Gentiles. God's promise to Israel has not failed because his promise has always been to the people of his kingdom. The true Israel that is eternal. Those who are spiritual Israelites in their hearts, which also includes Gentiles we see here. Paul said as much in Pastor Bill's verses a few weeks ago, Romans 6 through 8. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring. We will see this even more in the coming chapters. In chapters 10 and 11, Paul will continue to unpack this idea of Gentiles being grafted in to Israel's spiritual tree. But for now, I want us to see that God is faithful to his word. So that's our big idea. Our first big idea is this. And in God's sovereign mercy, in his sovereign mercy, God is always faithful to his promise. 
even when it plays out differently than we might expect. Christian, believer, God has always kept his promises. Do you believe this? When we see the promises that God has made to his people, do we believe them? Do we know, do we even know his promises? Or do we even go as far to understand what his promises actually mean? Or do we just assume we know what he means by his promises? Do we study his word? Do we believe he is faithful to it? Even if it's different than we might expect or want. Or do we say things like this, man, God has promised he would work out all things for good. But I thought that meant life would be smooth sailing. But actually, that means God will use the bad things in my life that I come up against. He will use them to redeem and redeem them for his good purpose. Or do we think, God promised he will always be with me. I thought that meant he would protect me from difficult things, from loss, from disease, from pain. But it actually means God will go through the difficult things with me. That is his promise. Or God promised that I can find peace in him that makes no sense. But it turns out in order for me to find that peace, it means that I have to submit my life to him. I have to die. I have to give up what I want to his goodwill, to his good plan for me. It means I have to lay my burdens down at his feet. I have to pray to him. I have to give him my desires. I have to obey him to find that peace that he promises. Church, God, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Let's look at Isaiah where he speaks of this. He speaks again of bringing in a nation to himself. Surely you will summon nations you know not and nations you do not know will come running to you because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. And then verse 8 says, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God kept his promise that he made to Israel, just not in the way that the Old Testament Israelites thought he meant. We can't fully know all that our sovereign and merciful God thinks and has done and does. We can't understand in our finite brains, right? Last week, Brian gave us a, an example I thought was a great illustration of his dog. I thought it was awesome. We are the dog. Thanks, Brian. Um, God is the dog owner. And I, I liked that example, and I wanted to think of one for myself. I, so I thought of me with my kids. Again, all examples, illustrations break down at some point. But there have been plenty of times with my kids where they have listened to me tell them something or promised them something and what, I, and what I said, but they didn't fully grasp what I meant. They couldn't fully grasp what I meant. And sometimes they come back to me later and say, well, I thought you meant this. No, child, it's not what I meant. It's not what I said. Believe that I will, as much as I can, I will mean what I can say because I'm not God, but we can believe that, that God will mean what he says and says what he means so we'd have to have this conversation. You must trust that I know what I mean and not just what you think I mean. I have to tell my kids this sometimes. For example, this week, my uh, wife took some of our kids to the dentist. So I told my son who was at home, hey, if you do your chores, dad's got to de- get some work done. I'm teaching this week, so, uh, if you, so I'll be on my computer. If you get your chores done real quick, you can watch some TV. He was excited about that. But he didn't know what all that encompassed and what that meant. He didn't know what time mom would be back. He didn't know I meant you can watch until mom gets back so you can finish your homeschooling. He didn't know the whole picture. So he proceeded to take his time to do his chores and run, and he ran out of time. And so mom got back. He couldn't watch. And there was a little bit of a, a, an episode there where I had to talk to him and say, he, you know, he, he freaked out a little bit. You said I could watch TV. But I had to explain to him. You don't know all that's going on. You don't know everything. You don't know the whole schedule of this whole family. And you don't know that I will still give you the screen time I promised you. I will still be true to my word. Son, do you know what I mean? No, you don't. But you think you do. (laughs) 
we come to the sovereign God, we need to trust that he keeps his promises. He never misspeaks. We just don't always get the whole picture of our father. Paul now will turn to the Old Testament prophets to show how this promise of mercy includes Jews and Gentiles. He wants to unpack that and back it up with scripture. And so first he quotes from Hosea. I'll give you guys a little insight into my brain for a second, not that it matters and should come to no surprise. But to be honest, sometimes, being real, sometimes when I see in the New Testament, they quote the Old Testament. Um, it just, for some reason, this picture pops in my head that uh, Michael Scott quoting Wayne Gretzky and calling it his own quote. Not that that matters, but uh, it's just my brain sometimes. So anyway, we'll back to the Bible. Romans 9, 25 says, as indeed God says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. In the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. So good. What a verse. These passages were written originally to speak about how God will have mercy on the people of Israel after they were exiled to Assyria because of their rebellion against God. If you aren't familiar with Hosea, let me share you a quick premise of what Hosea was from Hosea chapter 1. It's pretty intense. Hosea 1, 2 says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. Like, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And she actually bears him multiple children. So in Hosea, we see God calls this man to be his prophet and then asks him to do the unthinkable. He asks him to not only speak on his behalf to Israel, he then says, I'm going to use not only your words, I'm going to use your life as a real life example to this nation. Before we move on, as a real quick observation, who here feels like that sometimes? Like, hey, God, I'd love to be used by you, but maybe just use my words to tell people about Jesus. Maybe don't use my whole life. But God graciously says, my dear child, oh, my child, I will use all of you. I might even allow really hard things to come to you in your life because most often the examples and the actions have a greater witness than our words. Do you believe that? Do you see that? Have you experienced that? Seeing the example, not just hearing someone talk at us, but seeing how they've trusted in the Lord. So that's what God did with Hosea. He told Hosea to marry this woman, and he promised him that your wife's going to be unfaithful to you. There's some debate whether Gomer was already a prostitute at this time when Hosea entered into marriage with her or if God was just saying he knew she would be unfaithful. But either way, this prophet and this story of this prophet is a great illustration of God entering into a relationship with Israel. God took Israel, a people, knowing full well that they were already unfaithful sinners who would time and time and time and time again turn away from God into idolatry, turn away their hearts from him and turn it towards a false God. But the crazy beautiful thing about this book is the Lord continually tells Hosea to pursue Gomer, to forgive her, to bring her back, to take her home, to to continue to be her loyal husband despite her unfaithfulness and her multiple affairs. That's wild. It's crazy, isn't it? Also with Gomer being unfaithful, she conceives children and it's unknown for Hosea to be sure that these are his actual children or not. And God told, told Hosea to treat these kids as his own. But God also told Hosea to name two, two of them uh, these names that would speak to the nation, to Israel of their sin, names that would mean not my people and not my beloved. To signify this to Israel that God would one day punish them and that they would be sent to exile for a time. But God, promising he would be merciful, he would bring them back, a small number of Israelite survivors, a remnant, 
He would, re- he would not remain angry forever. And Paul quotes that from Hosea that he says when God promised, now I will call you. Those who were not my people, I will call my people. Those who were not beloved, I will call you my beloved. That is the promise that God was saying. So the Jews hearing this would have been very surprised by this point, that this of all verses is what Paul is using as proof for the Gentiles' salvation. The Jews heard this prophecy. They knew of Hosea. They thought it was just for them. And Paul is flipping this on its head, this prophecy, and saying, no, it doesn't only apply to Israel. God was also proclaiming that he was going to bring the Gentiles into the fold and call them his people, his beloved. Paul is supporting that claim that God's faithfulness, in his faithfulness, in his sovereignty, in his mercy, he fulfilled his promise. He did not fail. So that's our second point. Our second idea today is that in his sovereign mercy, God has called a people for himself, even though they are not entitled to it. God being over all things and wonderfully merciful has grafted the Gentiles into his kingdom. Again, we'll look at that more in the coming chapters. But we need to let this be real in our hearts. You and I, who are not God's people, who are far from him, he has called us. If, you've, if you have trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he has saved you. He has included you into the promise for Israel, for his people. God saw those who did not deserve love, who he did not love as his people, who were not entitled to his love and to his mercy. And he loved them because we are Children of sin and rebellion, we don't deserve his love. And yet God says, I will make you mine. I will love you forever. It will depend on my character and my faithfulness and my sovereignty and my mercy that I can call you mine. It will depend on me, not on your unfaithfulness. It's so good. We need to understand that we have been invited into that church. That promise applies to us. It's like this process of adoption. We talked about it in Romans 8 for a bit. Pastor Brian did. Many people in our church have adopted or been adopted. Many of us uh, might have family members who have gone through the the adoption process. I saw on Facebook a childhood friend of mine has adopted his second child this week, and it was exciting to see. It's really this beautiful example of God adopting us as his people. The parents go before a judge. And they acknowledge, here is this child, here is this stranger, here is this little person that I have no obligation to love or care for. I have no connect, uh, no connective DNA, no real reason why I would show compassion or mercy on this little person. But the parent says, I, and despite all that, no matter what that the truth is of that, I will choose to love them. I will choose to make them mine. I will declare before everyone and under the law that they are mine forever. I will give all of that I am to them. They will have full access to me as my true child, as their parent. It's so beautiful, really, isn't it? And God has done this for the Gentiles and the Jews. Paul is saying that it is, that is what Hosea was talking about. He has made us vessels of mercy. He has made us his children, and he declares now that we are his people. We are his beloved. Ephesians 2 says, once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. That's what we celebrated with baptism. We were, us who were once far from God have been brought near to him and made his children. So good. So now Paul turns to the next prophet to show how God's promise has not failed. He turns to Isaiah. We see this, if it will go, there we go. Isaiah, uh, in verses 27 through 29, Paul's going to quote Isaiah. It says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sound... Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. 
Some pretty heavy things there. If you're familiar with that, Paul here, quoting Isaiah, was referring to Moses' writings in Genesis. God promised to Abraham that his offspring would be as the sand of the sea, which did in fact happen. Abraham, his offspring became this multitude. Amazing. God fulfilled that promise. But Paul is saying through Isaiah, here God said that only a remnant from Israel would be saved as his true people of the kingdom. Remnant means to remain or to be left over. It refers to a small remaining amount that is saved. And Paul affirms this when he quotes Isaiah pointing to Sodom, which is a pretty wild example to use. If you remember the story of Lot, Abraham's nephew, who moved to the city of Sodom, and God saw just great wickedness and evil happening in this city. So God says, I'm going to destroy that city. There's just too much evil. I'm going to come show my judgment. But God spares Lot because of his promise to Abraham. We read that in Genesis 19, that God was about to judge the city. And it says here in verse 16, but, but Lot lingered. So the angel seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. It was God's mercy being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham. He remembered his promise and sent Lot out of the midst of the overflow, overthrow when, the over, when, he overflew, sorry, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So you'll remember that Lot's wife looked back, turned into a pillar of salt, right? So it, it makes even the... the what was a small remnant, even smaller. Just three people surviving, being a remnant of this city. Paul is saying, as God spared Lot and his daughters from the destruction of, this, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah, in the same way, he will save a small remnant from Israel from the coming destruction. This theme of God saving a remnant happens all over the Bible. Time and time again in the scripture, there are stories of God punishing sin as he rightly should, as he deserves to. But in his mercy, in his sovereignty, he spares a remnant out of that judgment because he is faithful to his promise. His promise has not failed. It just looks different than we expect it. So our third vital point is that in his sovereign mercy... God spares a remnant from complete destruction, even though they don't deserve it. Did Lot deserve this mercy? If you read the story, he was not a good dude. He, like just a few hours ago, was ready to hand over his virgin daughters to the men of the city. Not a good dude. Did not deserve mercy. Did his daughters deserve mercy? No, they do some pretty screwed up things. Like a few hours later, I'll let you read the story. I, don't, I won't mention it. They do some questionable things right after getting saved. Do they deserve it? No. Do we deserve mercy? No. We are not good. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we did not deserve mercy, he poured out his mercy. While we were his enemies, God loved us. Praise God that he is sovereign, that he is merciful, and he will give mercy to those who do not deserve it at all. As Brian said last week, it is not mercy if it's deserved. We can also see from these examples, from Hosea and from Isaiah, that the Lord knows what he is doing and has a long game in mind. He knows. He knows what he promised. He knows his plan to fulfill that promise. He knows what will happen. And he has the long game in mind. It, it makes me think of like babies, right? Uh, babies are cute and all. I love babies. I loved having babies. I love swaddling. Like I'm the king of swaddling. I, I would challenge you to a swaddle off. Uh, I love to swaddle my babies. I'd let, them, I'd let them suckle on my nose. It was the best thing. You can judge me. I don't care. Best memories of my life with my children are just like holding them. Tiny little infants. But then you get around other babies, and you're like, babies aren't as cool, <laughs> right? You're like, they smell, they throw up on you, they cry a lot. And then 
as soon as they're able to, they start disobeying you, right? They're still so tiny and cute. And you're like, you suck, <laughs> right? And yet, some reason, we keep feeding them, right? I'm like, sometimes I'm wondering, I'm like, should I have kept feeding you, right? No, that's bad. Uh, but we keep showing them mercy. They don't deserve it. I didn't deserve it when I was a baby. I sucked as a baby, right? We all do. But God, we show them mercy, and God shows us mercy. We have the long game in mind. We want our children to grow up to be ours to be adult children, to, to love us and for us to love them and to bless them and then for, for them to bless us. We have the long game in mind when there are these little things that just crap on us, right? It's just God in his mercy gives his mercy to those that don't deserve it. We find in God's call to both Jews and Gentiles who don't deserve it the proof of his sovereign mercy. In his sovereign mercy, he spares an undeserving remnant to be saved. This is important for us to understand, church. Even when it's difficult for our small brains to wrap our head around it, God's people, his kingdom people, the true Israel, is God's spared remnant that are people of faith in Jesus Christ. And it is a small remnant. And we should not be surprised by this. Jesus confirms this, that it is not the masses that will find eternal life. In fact, he says the opposite. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Salvation is an important thing. It's important for us to examine ourselves and to be sure that we are in the faith that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that we be sure that we actually have trusted in Jesus' finished work alone. It is important that we do not deceive ourselves and rest on good works or our heritage or our status and that we don't find ourselves down the road, this wide, broad road that everyone's headed down is, and is headed towards destruction, that we not be deceived. It's important. It's important. This was surprising to the Jews in Jesus' time. It's surprising. It was surprising in Paul's time. It's surprising in our time now. We don't like to hear this. But God's promise has never failed. The fact that he saves any sinner, anyone, is a glory to him. No one should have been saved. And he says, in my sovereign mercy, I will save a remnant for myself, for my people. He calls all but not everyone will respond to that call. He, he puts his hand out to everyone, but people reject him as we've been studying. It's a difficult thing to understand. I understand that. But we have to wrestle with this. We have to take our, our struggles and our doubts and our things that we don't understand to the feet of Jesus and wrestle with him. And he'll give us the answers. I like this quote. Timothy Keller wrapped it up well. He said, God is... A God who keeps his promises through surprising reversals. He is a God who keeps his promises in ways that cannot always be predicted. And he is a God who is utterly free to choose to give his undeserved mercy to whomever he wants. And to continue to choose to give others over to the life and the destiny that they have chosen. He always has been in Abraham's day, in Moses' time, the prophet's era, and today. God has a plan. He always has. He always will. And it's good. Objectively, it is good and right and lovely. We have to come to understand this, church. We don't have to like it. It doesn't have to sit well with us. He is God. We are not. It's not, but it is not right to come to the scripture and say, make this make sense to me so that I can easily swallow it and so that I will like the taste of it. Who are we to say that to God? He is sovereign. He is merciful. We are humans. We are fallen. We have finite understanding. We are the ones who are wrong. We are the ones who like to eat garbage and drink sewage and call it a feast. We need the Holy Spirit to work in us, to change us. We must come, have our appetite changed, our palate cleansed, so that we can taste and see that the Lord is good. 
to taste and see that his ways are good, that his plan is good, that his sovereignty is good, that his mercy is good and right, and he is in control and can be trusted. So what will our response be? To close, I want to look at one more story that has kept coming to mind while preparing this talk, a story of a king showing sovereign mercy to someone who did not deserve it. Seeing a beautiful response in that we see a beautiful response to the mercy shown to him. That story is the story of King David and Mephibosheth. You can say that 10 times fast. Mephibosheth. Um, If you know the story, let me remind you. King David is selected as Israel's next king. The only problem is there's already a king on the throne. And that king, Saul, doesn't like that King David has been chosen to be the next king. Doesn't like David. Attacks David, wants to kill David. All out wars with David, the chosen next king of Israel. The only problem is that David has a best friend, the son of Saul. They love each other, a deep love, a brotherly love a close connection, and Jonathan could have easily been mad about the position that he was in. He should have been next in line, but instead says, I will, choose, I will obey and I will follow what God has chosen. You are my king, David. And he says before they, the, one of the last times they meet, he says, well, show mercy to my family. And so later Saul and Jonathan end up dying in a battle. David is king in those days, For many years, it would have been the standard procedure to wipe out the previous regime. Any traces of any one of the bloodline that could threaten the throne, that David had the right to go after all of Saul's family, kids, grandkids, cousins, whatever, it, you name it, could have just wiped him out and been justified. He was the king. But instead, David, being the sovereign and being merciful, says, hey, How do I show some mercy to my best friend, Jonathan? How do I love him? Is there anyone left in his family? So his servants go and they find this crippled man who brings no value to David, to his household, to his kingdom. He is crippled. He can't work. All he is is a mouth to feed. And David says, bring Mephibosheth. And he says, you, this is what he says, As we read it, David said to Mephibosheth, do not fear for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Mephibosheth bowed and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? What a king of mercy and what a response. This is what God has done for us. When we had no value, no purpose, God says, I will invite you to eat at my table and you will be mine. What is our response? Let me ask you, as we bring this to a close, what is our response to God's sovereign mercy? Mercy is such a life-changing concept. It is. If you've experienced, you know it. If we, if we would just live as people who have received God's mercy and then extend that mercy to our loved ones, to our spouses, to our children, to our friends, to each other, to our enemies, as God calls us to. Even when people let us down, what a better world we would live in. To be the hands and feet of Jesus, to show them mercy Church, God has always initiated mercy, knowing we would fail, knowing we would be unfaithful, knowing we would let him down. He has continued to show mercy to Adam, to Abraham, to Israel, to David, to the disciples, to the Gentiles, to us. That is his way. He is sovereign and he is merciful. Some have said God changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but this is proof today, what we've read, that he has always been the same. A God with a sovereign plan, a merciful God who saves people who don't deserve it, a patient and gracious God who reveals himself so that more will turn to him, and ultimately a God who is 
the judge of all and his right to fairly punish wrongdoing and graciously pardon those who would submit themselves under the sacrifice and lordship of Jesus. So I ask you again, what will your response be to God's sovereign mercy? If you have not responded to him, I would encourage you to get right with him tonight. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. That you look at us and you don't just see our failings. You don't just see our crippleness. You don't just see our, our a sitting and not being valuable and worthy of anything really in our sin, God, because that's what we are. Thank you that you don't see us that way. Instead, you say, I will make you mine. I will call you my people. I will call you my beloved. Lord, make that real in our hearts so that we walk out and be vessels of mercy to the rest of a dying world that needs to know about it, that you would save more, that you would bring more into that remnant, that you would bring more to that narrow road, that narrow gate that few find. Jesus, for your glory, for our good. Thank you for this time, Lord. Pray this in your name. Amen.